Hey everyone, thanks for joining. Of course, back here with Brian. Got a cool video we're gonna do today, a little selection and kind of criteria for acquisitions. You know, we'll go through the process a little bit, um, you know, what goes into it. But first things first, Brian, how are you? Doing well, thanks for having us back. We appreciate yeah, okay. it. Awesome, awesome. Well, I see you got an exciting background this time around, so I'm happy to see it. But um, here, I guess uh, I'll throw it to you. Um, but yeah, walk walk me through kind of the acquisition or you know selection criteria. Number one, and maybe start off with what you guys kind of look for as a general, and then we'll go through. Can be a hypothetical examples or or sure. you know one you guys have made. Sure. No, it, it's it's a great question, and and it's a really important part of who we are as an organization, Jason. So, when we think about the hydrogen value proposition, we look at the whole chain and we really think there's multiple parts to the, the hydrogen value chain. Um, each part needs to have its own selection criteria. So our boiler fits in what we call the application marketplace. How will people use hydrogen, right? Hydrogen for hydrogen's sake is nice, but it actually has to have a business tied to it. And what makes the boiler so, so relevant and sort of is a defining piece of our selection criteria is the addressable market, right? So how big is the market for this use? And when you think about steam, just because it doesn't have the same daily visibility that mobility has, doesn't mean it's any less of a market, right? So the commercial industrial steam market is a $30 billion market. It's just one we don't see every day. So when we start our criteria to select any tech, it's always about the market. Is there a business case? And is there a, an addressable market in need of a solution that brings a greener, a more energy efficient solution to that world? And so we always start with the business case and look at the addressable market. Because if you think about it, you know, giving you a real live example, our boiler is market facing with a $30 billion opportunity. Now, obviously not everybody is going to buy our boiler. We would love that, but if you think about a market of that size, if we're able to capture 5% of that market, it's a billion five in annual sales, right? A billion five in annual sales, just at 5% of the market. And then you have all of the recurring revenue pieces. So the, if the addressable market is there, and the next piece that we look at is how is the revenue stream generated from this particular technology? So important that you have a recurring revenue stream, right? Very software-like when you think about it, subscription fees, right? So you think about the boiler and I, I think it's helpful to show the application of it, right? So $30 billion market will sell our boilers, right? So there's an initial sale, so there's revenue from the sale and then there's an O&M piece that goes along with it. So you're going to have that trip, that annual drip for the next 20 years from that sale where you have boiler maintenance on um, an operation assistance that go along with it. So you always have that recurring revenue stream. And then in the sense of the boiler, there's the third piece, which is when you reach, you know, utility size applications where you're delivering steam, right? So we would actually sell steam to cities that are looking to change their heat and hot water systems from fossil fuel based fueled systems to green systems. So we could actually deliver that heat and hot water as we reach critical scale with our solution. But that's the first step anywhere we look on the hydrogen value chain is always what is the addressable market. So then we sort of take a next step down. So when we look at hydrogen generation, you know, obviously there's a very significant addressable market. Um, hydrogen generation expands beyond all of the industries and all of the applications because it's the key piece to it, right? And when you think about generation, I, I, our belief is there's room for all of the different types or colors of hydrogen, right? So you're seeing right now the world is dominated by gray hydrogen, but gray hydrogen with carbon capture becomes a blue hydrogen, right? Blue hydrogen also can be the, the separation of the natural gas molecules into its elements. And then of course, capturing that carbon as well. And then the third one is green hydrogen, which is obviously hydrogen generated from renewable sources. Um, it is the most expensive today. So the next piece in our evaluation of, of particular technologies is what is the potential to become cost competitive with fossil fuels? 
you know, is it in two years, five years, 10 years, 20 years? Because right? it's critical to understand what is the value proposition, not just from a green perspective, but from in a cost and an energy perspective. So you want to deliver things that are cost effective in delivering the energy or the resources that are needed. So we always look at what is the cost structure of the particular technology. Um, assuming that it has a path to being cost competitive, then the question becomes, is the technology unique enough? Is it different enough, right? That it has a sustainable foothold on an opportunity set, you know, so that you have a path where you can build market share that you can defend. Um, you know, you want to make sure that the patents are right, right? So we have a, uh, you know, whether it be our patent council or our relationship with Cal Capella Partners, all we think about is what's the patent? Is it patentable? Can we extend them? And are they defensible? Because there's a lot of different patent strategies out there and there's a lot of different ways to think about it. But the key is, is that being a smaller company, you want to make sure that what you have, you can defend. Um, and we think that's critical into picking the right technologies because there will be competition. If you think for one minute that you're investing in tech that has no competition, it's kind of fool's gold. The reality is there's always competition. Markets are efficient and people move quickly. So for us, it's market, then it's cost competitiveness, then it's technology differentiation and defensibility. Do we have a technology that is defensible and that we will be able to sustain that over the, over the next five and 10 years? So for us, when we think about our hydrogen generation platform, we see that as the next evolution of Jericho. And we see that as how you'll see our selection criteria play out as we launch our generation platform, because we believe there is tremendous opportunity to advance what we're seeing in the hydrogen generation side. Yeah, look, uh, thank you. Kind of touched on a lot of great points for people who have never been through the acquisition process, you know, adjustable market, how defendable is it, you know, really barriers to entry, kind of touch on everything um, that if you got a business school, you'd, uh, you'd at least have heard of, and this is the real, real life right. application. So uh, thanks so much for that. Um, I've got a question for you, and this might be a great tidbit and, and a great kind of side video as well. And I'll ask it, you know, people say, and I would love to get your kind of answer from a Jericho standpoint, you know, people say, oh, like I'm used to hearing about green energy and green solutions, but they typically cost more and produce less. I'm curious on, you know, that old style of thinking where now you are seeing green technologies that are even producing more and saving money, but, you know, maybe in a mixed answer, I know long-winded question, would love to get your view on that. Um, and also kind of in contrast to where the world's going, uh, you know, cost of carbon is getting uh, more expensive. Governments are charging companies more and more. And I would love to hear kind of your answer to at least the old style thinking that, you know, I just quoted. Yeah, so I think that I think that there's a lot of different pieces to that, right? So the idea of being green is a very personal point. So what we've seen in the in the new green energy world is how people define green and what the box is they draw, we call it, right? So our boiler has zero emission, but our boiler also works with any hydrogen source. So you can choose if you'd like your hydrogen from a gray source, a blue source, or a green source, right? So how green is your overall solution will depend on which one of those you pick. So if you think about the electric car market today, um, we think about those cars as being green, but they're really not very green, right? So your car doesn't have any emissions, just like our boiler doesn't have any emissions, but it's a pretty hard argument to make that when you plug that car in, that your power is coming from a grid that has a whole blended resource base. It has coal, it has, it has natural gas, it has non-green elements to that electricity source. And if you take it a step further, the mining that goes on to generate the catalyst, you know, the battery component, um, you know, they're far from green. If anyone has ever looked at a lithium mine, it makes an oil well look like child's play. So the reality is green is defined by the box that you draw. And in our world, you know, in the hydrogen space, I think you're going to see the evolution to where you are able to deliver renewable-based hydrogen generation into 
applications that are emission free. And I think collectively you will eventually get to a dollar per kilogram. Because remember the thing about renewables that hydrogen offers that is so special, right? Renewables produce at times a day when we don't need as much power. So if you look at California, it's a great example. California's tremendous renewable resource. The problem is, is that they're all in the morning and the time when the sun is at its height and demand is when the peak demand is 4 to 8 p.m. in the afternoon when the sun is setting, right? So imagine hydrogen, you take that green resource, use that when the energy is free, negative, they're paying you to use it to generate your hydrogen. You store it and then you use fuel cells or a boiler like ours to deliver that energy back to the market during peak power when you don't have green resources. So that to me is the holy grail. It's called time shifting, right? The opportunity to use green energy and hydrogen to time shift. So the idea of green really comes down to how you define it, but you have to start somewhere, right? At the end of the day, you have to start with point A. And I think that whether it's the application or the end use, starting there with a green application, a zero emission application is, is phenomenal, right? You've already, you've already moved forward light years by taking away the emissions associated with the application. I mean, in our little world for our boilers, 35% of them out there are still coal. They still are coal-based boilers. Imagine if we just took those 35% and replaced them with ours, and they continue to use gray sources for hydrogen. You've taken all that coal, that coal emissions out of play. Uh, just a great starting point. So, you know, the idea of being green has lots of different levels, but you have to start somewhere. And to us, you know what, if you can deliver green applications, whether it be a boiler, an electric car, anything like that, it's a phenomenal place to start. Yeah, awesome. Look, uh, you crushed that. <laughs> uh, honestly, thanks so much, Brian. Uh, yeah, incredible insights. And, you know, kind of now taking this to the, the acquisition the acquisition side, you know, uh, fantastic. You know, Jericho's got some boiler, uh, you know, and not just some boiler, the boiler, and we'll talk about it in its own video coming up. Uh, but back to acquisitions, you know, what, what comes across your guys' desk? Uh, you know, give me some maybe examples of things you've seen and just paint the picture for someone. And you don't have to say, hey, we chose this, but this is just something we looked at. And then we went through and we noticed this maybe wasn't an element. So we passed. And I would love, uh, you know, some people, uh, you know, asking questions about, is there any example? Brian could share about things that have crossed his desk uh, would be pretty interesting. Yeah, so our, 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 our inbox has grown in terms of things that we're seeing from, from a hydrogen um, application, generation, transportation, and storage perspective. So we are seeing things across the whole value chain. Um, I think for us, there are definitely a lot of really interesting novel technologies that we have passed on simply because we don't see the fit for our value add. So we are active um, investors. We are not passive investors. It's not our model, right? We believe our point of differentiation is the ability to help commercial ready technology get to the commercial market, get their customer base in place. Um, and so what we've seen is a lot of really good technologies that are just a little too early stage for us. Um, that we've not participated in simply because they're early stage, not because they're not really interesting technologies. And so you know, what we spend our time with right now is looking at applications and particularly generation technologies that we think are ready for the commercial market. The thing that we find consistent in all the things that are commercial ready, they usually started somewhere around 2010 in developing it in the lab because you're dealing with material science. So there really are very, very few shortcuts, Jason, to getting those ready. There's a ton of trial and error, right? It is not surprising to us that each of the deals we look at that we like the most end up with a scenario where, well, we started this in 2005, we started this in 2010, we started this in 2008, because it takes that long to get material science. This is hard science, you know, to get it to commercial stage. Um, and a lot of times, you know, people come from a software background and they think about it, say, oh my God, they've been laboring at this for 10 years. That's crazy. Cause software moves quicker, right? Software, software doesn't fall victim to the nine pregnant lady theory, right? Because at the end of the day, the more engineers you put, a lot of times you can accelerate the software. Hydrogen does fall victim, right? So a woman can have a baby in nine months. Nine women can't have a baby in one month. 
So there's only so much advancement you can make with hydrogen and material science as you move them forward. It just takes longer. So to us, that's really critical. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you so much for the added information. I know a lot of people ask some great questions. You know, I really like this one. Obviously, happy that you're able to absolutely knock it out of the park. We'll do a deeper dive into more the tech, the boiler, um, and, and really the industry as we go forward. And a great time if anyone has questions, you know, that really are, I guess, applicable, but also about hydrogen, please drop them below. Brian would love to cover a lot. And we'll do a Q&A video coming up. But Brian, thanks so much for joining. This was an awesome video. Thanks, Jason. Appreciate it. You have a good afternoon. Mm -hmm.